let me introduce myself. My name is Alberto Rodriguez, and I'm the Senior Program Manager at Public Energy Technology Team here at New America. And I'm really happy to welcome you to this uh, fellowship program's Creating Pathways to Career in Public Interest Technology event. I am delighted to, to be joined by my great partners in the work of public interest technology. But uh, let me take a couple of seconds and just talk a little bit about what we do here at, at, at New America. And New America public interest technology team works with partners, including government agencies, non-governmental organizations, advocacy groups, universities, policymakers, and other mission-driven organizations to develop the public interest technology system. We strive to make this ecosystem accessible, transparent, diverse, equitable, among other things. And one of the key things is uh, including new people and instilling new talent into the ecosystem. So that's why we are here with uh, with our fellows from uh, the from Schmidt Futures and Coding It Forward. We will be talking about a little bit of, uh, of of their programs and how are they bringing new talent into the public interest technology ecosystem. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, my fellow speakers. Uh, Danielle Holman is the manager of talent selection at Schmidt Futures. She is the founding selection leader at uh, for the Quad Fellowship, which is the first of its kind scholarship program for master's and doctoral students. I'll let her talk a little bit more about that. Uh, prior to Schmidt, she served as a director of admissions at Teague Fellowship. We also have with us Johnny Cooper, who is the manager of the Associate Pro Product Manager Program, Alshon Schmidt, and she leads the uh, both the cohort and the strategies at that program. She spent her career at the intersection of tech, public policy, and social impact. And prior to, to, to Schmidt, she was a product manager at, uh, at Pymetrics, a startup that uses AI and neuroscience to make hiring fair and predictive. Uh, last but not least, we have Rachel Dodell, co-founder and executive director of Coding It Forward. Uh, back in 2017, she was uh, she was part of the first uh, cohort, and ever since, she's played an active role in that in that institution, uh, creating new new pro pro programs, and new additions for uh, people that want to get into public service, and, and especially at the beginning of their careers. So let's hear a little bit more about them. I'll give them each a couple of minutes to talk about their projects and programs. And then we will we will jump in into some questions where we will try to, to find uh, common ground between between both our problems uh, of bringing new people in tech and also what we we can learn from 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 each other. Um, I'll I'll leave the floor for Danielle. Thank you so much, Alberto, Vantisha, and, and the entire New America team. Really appreciate uh, the time that we have to share about these exciting opportunities. Um, so to kick off uh, with the Quad Fellowship, we are an initiative of uh, Schmidt Futures and work in collaboration with the Quad governments of um, Australia, India, Japan, and the United States to launch a fellowship program for prospective graduate students. Um, so our goal is to uh, uh, really create a network of leading um, practitioners in STEM from across the four quad countries to address um, the challenges of today and tomorrow. And so one of the ways that we do that is by sponsoring um, uh, graduate study, um, but also providing great programming for um, these talented folks that are thinking about how do I combine my interest and passion for um, this field with uh, an ability to create solutions to make the world better for others. Um, the idea was ideated by the quad leaders themselves. So uh, last fall uh, in September, um, President Biden, along with the prime ministers of the other three quad governments, uh, came together for the Quad Leader Summit to think about ways in which um, they can address 21st century issues. And one of the um, uh, ideas they created was a, a people to people exchange and a fellowship program. And they tapped Schmidt Futures, uh, which is a film doc initiative of Eric and Wendy Schmidt, um, and known for really betting early and exceptional talent and creating talent programs uh, to administer the fellowship. Um, so that happened last September. They notified Schmidt Futures uh, November um, that uh, we would be uh, kind of honored to, to administer the fellowship and we had to get something up and running right away. So we've been kind of hitting the ground running in, in terms of launching the application. It's been open since March. 
March. Um, and so the, the kind of date that to remember is June 30th. So we have um, just about a month left to apply. Um, so we really hope that folks who are interested in this opportunity apply soon. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what uh, we offer. So first, um, we have a combination of financial and programmatic benefits. So the financial benefit um, is a $50,000 personal award um, that goes directly to the student um, to support their graduate study. And it's a really flexible award. It can go towards tuition, um, but it can also go towards room and board, um, education-related expenses such as uh, research, um, travel to uh, education conferences, um, and it can be um, uh, combined with other fellowship uh, and scholarship funding that um, students may receive. So really flexible award. And there's also an opportunity for an additional needs-based funding of up to $25,000. So $75,000 total um, that uh, students are eligible for. And in addition, we offer comprehensive programming um, during the fellowship year. So when fellows are announced, which will be in a, um, end of October, beginning of November, um, from there, they'll have access to our pre-programming where they'll be able to connect with the other fellows from the um, all, all across the um, the four countries. Um, they'll have a chance to uh, get graduate uh, application support. So um, at the time of applying, um, you may not have already been accepted to graduate school and might be applying for the following year of 2023-2024. So we'll have advisors to support that process um, and other workshops um, related to relevant topics. Um, and then there is a, uh, a residential experience. So a five-day trip in one of the four quad countries each year. It'll rotate each year. Next year, it'll be in Australia. Um, all 100 fellows that will select will be able to come together to meet each other which is uh, of, of course fantastic um, because they'll be going to different schools during the academic year but also it's an opportunity for us to connect with um, STEM leaders from the different quad countries bring them together to really be in community with our fellows um, certainly you know provide speaker series but also to really engage um, with them on a more one-on-one um, uh, -on -one personal level uh, there's mentorship opportunity and programming that we're building into the program so we're really excited um, about the connections that our fellows will create um, through our programming because of course the financial benefit is helpful and important but I really think it's the network and the long lasting effects uh, of being in community with other folks who are problem solving in really interdisciplinary ways that is going to move work forward and really be the most beneficial for our fellows. Um, after the residential experience um, all of the fellows will go on to their graduate programs um, and then during their graduate year they'll still continue to have access to virtual programming and then um, we'll have a robust alumni programming. So the fellowship year is only one year but but really the connection as a quad fellow is supposed to be lifelong. And so we are really committed to making sure that we are um, cultivating this community by engaging our, our fellows long after they finish their uh, kind of fellowship year. We accept both master's and PhD students and both prospective and current students. So. We are uh, accepting folks for the 2023-2024 academic year. So that means if you're interested in applying for next year and are not yet um, in graduate school, you're eligible to apply. Um, or if you're a current graduate student, um, so a master's or PhD student that will have at least one more year. Um, so you'll be enrolled in the 2023-2024 academic year. Um, this could also be a great opportunity for you. Uh, related to the other eligibility requirements, um, students must be uh, over 18 uh, in order to apply, but there's no age maximum. So if there is a, you know, um, if you are um, interested in taking a kind of a professional gap and, and having, or you already have one and you have a couple of years of professional experience and want to go back for your graduate study, this could be a great option for you. Um, applicants must be a citizen of one of the four quad countries. So Australia, India, Japan, or the United States. Um, but you don't have to currently reside in one of those countries um, as long as you're a citizen. Uh, you have to have received your bachelor's degree by 2023. Um, so uh, by uh, June of 2023, you will have to complete your graduate studies in order to start. Uh, uh, sorry, you have to complete your undergraduate studies in order to start graduate studies in the fall. So um, uh, that's one piece. And then um, uh, superior academic excellence. So we're really looking for folks that um, are uh, excited about engaging in their uh, their discipline and field at the higher level uh, academically, and also thinking about the impact of that work more broadly. Um, so we really consider both academic excellence and a passion for STEM and society to be our kind of dual pillars of um, uh, our selection criteria that we look for. Um, and then in addition to those things, we're thinking about folks who are excited to be a part of this cohort. So we there's a reason we're not a quad prize. We really believe in the power of a network and a cohort and bringing people together. Um, and so we want folks that are excited about being a part of this cross-country um, interdisciplinary program. 
And then lastly, an orientation towards results. So having a big idea is great, but uh, being able to act on those ideas and get things done is, is really what we're looking for. So um, those are the eligibility requirements and some of the selection criteria. Uh, I'm uh, happy to answer other questions about the program, um, and then I'll turn it over back to uh, Alberto. Thank you, Danielle. That was a lot of information, but, uh, but if folks want to check it out more, we, we will drop a, a link for the program on, on the chat. Let me then turn it on to Joni uh, about the Associate Pro Pro Product Manager program. So, Johnny, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Alberto. And it's always fun being on panels with other folks at Schmidt Features representing different programs. Um, it gets me, I probably heard Danielle's pitch 20 times about the Quad Fellowship and every time I hear it, I get very excited. Um, but, but I work closely with Danielle uh, at Schmidt Features and I specifically oversee the Associate Product Manager program at Schmidt Features. Um, and so in a nutshell, the APM program, what we do is recruit um, really bright, talented, recent graduates um, who really have a passion for applying their technical skills towards social good. Um, and this is particularly in a product manager capacity and, and more than happy to share more about what a product manager is perhaps in the, in the QA, Q and A or, or later on in the session, um, but essentially how the program works. Uh, so we recruit kind of a cohort of 10 to 12 folks each year. Um, they join Schmidt Features and this is a rotational program in nature. Um, so they shop around uh, three to four social impact projects over the course of two years in a product manager capacity. Um, and something really cool about this program is not only do you get to work on hard problems, learn what product management is like in the social impact space, um, but you're also developing along the way and really get exposure to the different flavors of product management in the social impact space. Um, so to give you an example of that, really our APM projects run the gamut. Uh, we've had APMs that have worked in the criminal justice space, uh, that have worked in agriculture, in education, uh, and happy to share more about project examples um, also later on in this conversation. Um, so, so as mentioned, kind of I view the program as twofold, where you're really kind of applying your technical skills towards these hard societal problems in partnership with social impact organizations. Uh, but they, at the end of the day, similar to the Quad Fellowship, uh, this is a cohort-based program in nature. Um, so very much kind of cultivate programming where you foster a strong community of folks with like-minded technologists um, and really experts in the social impact space. Um, and we've also been beefing up programming to really kind of help you develop the product management skill set. Um, so kind of creating, as we speak, a product management bootcamp uh, where we're partnering with a large product management uh, provider and embedding specifically social impact curriculum into that bootcamp uh, so that you can be ready to go kind of as you embark on your product rotations with Schmidt Futures and with our external host organizations. Um, in terms of kind of the applicants we look for uh, for the APM program, uh, definitely looking for folks that have some kind of uh, technical acumen. We note in our job description um, that uh, kind of majors uh, and minors we target are in computer science as well as engineering. Uh, that being said, that is not a hard requirement. We also look for kind of equivalent uh, forms of experience. Uh, so if you majored in statistics, um, other forms of mathematics, uh, data science, um, that is also something we very much welcome. Uh, we also love kind of having folks that couple technical experience experience with more kind of qualitative and liberal arts experiences. Um, I, I probably am biased, but I, I feel like uh, some of the most talented product managers and social impact I've worked with uh, have both kind of a blend of technical acumen as well as um, kind of that liberal arts and kind of humanities perspective. Um, and then in terms of kind of other uh, hard requirements, so we look for folks that are recent graduates. Um, uh, we've had a couple of APMs that have a couple years of experience in joining the APM program. Um, so you can be a recent graduate, uh, kind of graduating in 2023, uh, or you could have graduated one to two years prior to that. Um, and then just, I, I echoed this a little bit previously, but in terms of what we look for in candidates, I think first and foremost, kind of a, a passion for social impact and doing good in this world. And that's kind of our, our top baseline. And I'm sure Rachel and, and Danielle could attest to that for their programs as well. Um, I think also kind of comfort in nav navigating ambiguity, um, product management and technology in the social impact space is candidly super messy. It's an amazing and fulfilling experience, but having someone who's truly comfortable with navigating ambiguity certainly helps. Um, and then and also someone who's a, a learner and kind of curious, curious at heart. Um, as I mentioned, a part of the program, even though you're tactically applying your technical skills, um, the point of it is also to learn and kind of get exposure to different kind of kinds of uh, product management in this space. Um, so someone who's willing to take risks within reason to experiment and to really kind of push the boundaries of what's possible, both for Schmidt futures and our partner organizations, um, is something we certainly look for. 
Um, and then in terms of kind of deadlines to keep an eye out for, uh, so our application is currently live, which is very exciting for our 2023 APM cohort. Um, applications, uh, we're, we're accepting applications, I believe, uh, through August 1st, and then we'll kick off the interview process um, at the end of August, early September, and we hope to deliver um, offers to folks um, kind of mid-fall, uh, so around uh, mid to end of October. Um, so happy to dive into any aspect of, of what I just mentioned. And uh, yeah, thank you so much again, Alberto, for, for having us and, and having the APM program represented. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Well, it, it's definitely super interesting to see how the community aspect and, and the community building is, is shaping up in, the, in, your, in your programs. And I want to, and before I, I turn to Rachel, I just want to say that also another piece and uh, another uh, view that the public interest technology team is looking for is how to build that community outside of the of the so, so we, uh, we love to hear about the, these and many other fellowship programs. Rachel, I'll leave it up to you to wrap us up on this on this first uh, section of the, on the talk. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. And again, thanks to the whole New America team for hosting us this afternoon. I'm Rachel Jodell. I'm one of the co-founders of Putting It Forward and currently serve as the organization's executive director. For those of you unfamiliar, Coding It Forward is a nonprofit organization dedicated to building new opportunities and pathways for engaging early career technologists in the public interest technology space. Uh, we're also funded by Schmidt Futures, so we're definitely keeping it in the Schmidt family this afternoon, so I'm super excited uh, to be on this panel. Uh, in terms of our programs and how we're building these pathways that I'm talking about, uh, we run two different primary programs at the moment. The first is the Civic Digital Fellowship, which I think folks are more familiar with. We launched that back in 2017 as a response to some of our own problems when we were students. At the time, we were college students looking to work in government um, with a technical background, but unfortunately, there just really were not any internship opportunities, and I think the field of public interest technology was still in a very early stage that uh, was still looking to build new ways for folks to get involved. Um, so we approached some of our mentors and asked them, hey, how can we do this? How can we become technologists in the government? And we were fortunate that they were willing to take a bet on our idea and help us build out a fellowship model. Um, our first cohort had 14 students at the US Census Bureau compared to our cohort that's starting in just two weeks, which has 160 students at 10 different federal agencies and 33 different host offices across three states, three city or three counties and uh, over 10 different cities. So we've grown quite rapidly uh, over the past five or so years. Um, and in terms of who we bring into our programs and what they do, um, we really uh, work with a range of students, um, folks who are in boot camp and certificate programs. We also work with undergraduate students as well as graduate students. So no matter what kind of stage you're at in your academic journey, there is likely an opportunity for you. Um, I'm also thrilled to share that um, we were able to open up our program at the state and local level to non-US citizens. So if you're someone who's studying on an F1 or a J1 visa, or you're a permanent resident, um, you're more than welcome to also apply to our Civic Innovation Core program, which is at the state and local level. Uh, in terms of what our programs cover, uh, we hire predominantly software engineers, product managers, designers, and data scientists. Uh, to work on challenges across federal, state, and local government for about a 10-week period over the course of the summer. As I mentioned, our programs are starting relatively soon. This summer, they're running from June 13th until August 19th, so we do not currently have applications open, but I will share some more information in the chat about subscribing to our newsletter so that in case you are interested in learning when the next round opens in the fall, uh, you'll be the first to know when that happens. Thank you, Rachel. So, as 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 our audience uh, is is hearing, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for new for newcomers into this field. And what I mean by this field is this over over encompassing umbrella that we're calling public interest technology. So, I I, I notice. Let me just jump straight into the into the questions to all of you. Um, I notice again that an interesting part is that you are targeting targeting early careers and graduates. Rachel did mention that that, that was a part that that was part of the problem solving. Uh, but what is it that you are searching for when you're 
uh, you're focusing on, on, on the youth, on, on newcomers into the field. Uh, how did you get into that into that decision? Let me let me ask uh, Joni, would you start with this? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think very much echoing Rachel. I, one of the reasons why we focused on early career folks as the inflection point for the APM program is that we noticed that there just weren't enough pathways that exist uh, into this type of field in social impact. Um, so kind of that that um, void in, in, in the system uh, really kind of inspired us to think more about what are some concrete pathways and programs that we can create uh, to really kind of catch this talent at a key infl inflection point, an example in graduating school, um, and give them the proper training and experiences they need to further pursue careers in public interest tech, uh, hopefully for the rest of their lives to some capacity. Um, so I think, you know, the void in, uh, you know, pathways not existing certainly stuck out to us. I think also just meeting the moment, I think Gen Z is one of the most alt altruistic generations we've had to date. Like, they're incredibly fired up. They want to apply their talents towards social good. Um, so recognizing this is a very powerful inflection point given where our society is at today um, and making sure these folks have those experiences and skills um, to really make a difference in the hard problems that we all face. Thank you. And Danielle, I mean, what about the Quad Fellowship? I know that, I mean, given that you're, you're focusing on grad students and doctoral students, you're still early career. Um, what was it that, that brought you here? Yes, and I, I see what we are seeking to do with Quad really in tandem with what um, both uh, the APM program and Coding It Forward do. So it's about how do we give um, excited, motivated, talented folks practical experience to prepare to for careers in public interest and prepare to solve big challenges that'll make lives better for others. And so one way to do that is through experience, so through you know internships and career pathways. And another way to do that is to upskill um, through graduate study. And so whether it's someone um, getting their master's or their PhD to really um, hone in on their skills within their discipline to really elevate re advanced research. Um, I think that's really in tandem with the professional experience that they get in other opportunities. So um, I, I think that's, you know, how all of our programs intersect. And I think that's a part of the reason to target early career um, folks. I will say the Quad Fellowship, uh, while we anticipate that most of our, our applicants will be earlier in their career. Um, we're also excited about potential applicants that are pivot, pivoting. And really what we're in, in excited about is the energy and the new energy that people have towards public interest and how are they going to apply that to answer really tough challenges and to um, kind of do innovative work. Um, that's what we're excited about. Thank you, Danielle. And Rachel, I mean, you, you, you were part of that cohort. So uh, both as, as a director and someone was, who was there, like, what do you think uh, the youth brings to this, this, this programs? Sure. Um, I think when we were initially starting our program, something that we really noticed on college campuses is that big tech companies and hot startups are everywhere on campus recruiting technology students all the time but there were almost no social impact organizations dedicated to recruiting and retaining talent in the technology space. So we just started to notice, hey, we're interested in using our skills in this kind of way, but who's out there working on these things that we care about, which is why we started to recognize that there was a void. And as we started to do more research, particularly in the public service space, we found out that there's actually a huge gap in the talent pipeline, especially in federal government. Presently, only 3% of federal government employees are under the age of 30, and 14% of federal government employees are eligible to retire in the next few years, which, uh, you know, means that our public service workforce is currently aging out of their jobs, and we really need to be focusing on recruiting the next generation of individuals to come in and bring a new perspective to public service. So, um, there's a lot of folks who are working on this problem. We decided to tackle it from the uh, kind of early career perspective, since that's what we knew and that's where we were coming from. Um, and like Danielle mentioned as well, we also welcome folks who are changing careers, despite uh, you know being an undergrad when we started our program. We've had fellows who have ranged in age from 18 years old all the way to 40 years old. So if you're someone watching this who's gone back to school, who's in a certificate program, or is thinking about how you can maybe use some of your skills um, in a new and exciting way, we, we definitely welcome an application from you as well. Thank you. I want to ask everyone another question, which is, I mean, 
you're very good, you're new programs, but can you share some success stories? And some, some either some pains or some stories from 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 the people that have gone through your programs and have, you know, done an impact. Um, let me ask. I'm actually going to start with you, Rachel, on this one. Uh, any any kind of stories that you that you would like to to share other than yours? <laughs> Sure. Um, we have quite a few amazing success stories, and I'll also share a link to our GitHub, which is where all of the previous projects and presentations are hosted from our fellows. Um, but one of my favorite stories is a fellow named Christian Muscardi, who actually currently still works at the U.S. Census Bureau. And a few years ago, uh, Christian was one of our fellows at the time working on a very specific economic survey, which essentially classified commodities into different codes. There's something called a NAICS code, um, which I won't get into kind of all the details there, but essentially it's important economic information that U.S. Census Bureau has to collect on every kind of company that conducts business um, so we can better understand how our economy functions. And it's a six digit code. Um, folks often get it wrong when filling out surveys because there are a lot of codes and it gets very confusing about which one your business might be categorized in. Um, and at the time, the Census Bureau was actually using people to manually check every single survey response to make sure that the codes were entered correctly, or if a code wasn't included, figuring out how to categorize a particular business, which is obviously incredibly time consuming. It's a waste of resources. And um, there's a better way to do that, right? Uh, as technologists, we know that we can uh, automate things. Um, so Christian came in and built an algorithm, which ended up accurately predicting the codes. I think the accuracy rate was 96% um, and is actually able uh, to be applied to other surveys that the Census Bureau conducts as well. And my understanding, some other agencies are currently um, adopting similar technologies. And uh, that ended up saving the Census Bureau, I believe, close to $2 million in taxpayer funds um, just through human resources alone in 10 weeks. This is a 10 week internship program, and that is what someone was able to accomplish. So I think it really goes to show when you bring in folks with um, different perspectives or cutting edge skills, there's a lot of incredible work that can be done that, um, you know, frees up the amazing public servants at the U.S. Census Bureau to focus on things that can't be automated and that technology can't be used for. So that's personally one of my favorite success stories. Christian is now, like I said, Still at the Census Bureau, and he's actually managed several of our fellows um, over the past years as well. So it's been a great kind of full circle moment um, for him to be an early career manager, um, helping bring in the next generation as well. That's an amazing story, Rachel. Thank you for sharing it, John, Johnny. Uh, I know that APM has has already a, a set of cohorts. Any any kind of uh, story that you could share over there? Yeah, when you asked this question, Alberto, my mind went in like six different directions. I think I, I always think about the success stories of, of each of the APMs that, that we bring in. But um, I think I think of success in two ways. I think uh, the first being success APMs have on their social impact projects uh, during the APM program over the course of two years, and then kind of what their post APM program pathways look like and, and where they head next. Um, so on the first piece, I alluded to this a little bit in the introduction, but it's, it's pretty incredible how much progress and, uh, kind of success an APM can make in such a targeted amount of time, uh, in partnership with social impact organizations. Um, so for, for additional context, our AP, APMs are on projects for about six to nine months, um, doing some really incredible work across a variety of different domains and problem spaces. Um, so to give you an example, one of our uh, senior APMs, Annalise, uh, partnered with a criminal justice uh, nonprofit tech startup called Recidivis. Uh, and what she did is worked with the team on building out um, tools so that parole and probation officers uh, could better triage their cases so that they can understand the current state of their populations and, and ultimately support better support incarcerated individuals and, and hopefully even reduce the recidivism rates. Um, so that's one kind of uh, example of an APM project. I think completely on the other side of the spectrum, we have another APM project led by um, one of our uh, former APMs, Sam, uh, who partnered with Duolingo, um, which is one of the largest language learning platforms uh, in the world. Uh, and he headed up as a PM a variety of analytics um, and experiment uh, experimentation driven tools uh, where he kind of tested what type of functionality uh, would be best kind of absorbed by learners so that they can better learn and, and apply kind of language skills 
um, whether it be in university or wherever they travel. Um, so those are two fundamentally different paths and kind of success stories within those APM projects that, that APMs have had. Um, and I think just touching quickly on the second point of where APMs go next, um, I think success for the APM program is if APMs continue their careers in public interest. Um, and we've been amazed at how many folks after the APM program have continued to do that. Um, so Sam, for example, is now a full-time product manager at Duolingo. Um, we've actually had a couple of APMs that have gone on to start their own um, ventures at kind of the intersection of tech and social impact. And then we've had other APMs as well that have taken on kind of strategy roles in, in larger social enterprises. Um, so kind of looking at the career paths um, that our APMs have taken so far, one really cool thing we've learned is that the product management skill set our APMs develop in the program could actually be applied to a variety of different functions in the social impact space. So one kind of natural trajectory is that, you know, an APM continue, continues on as a product manager in social impact, but they could also pivot to a strategy role or a policy role or start their own company in social impact. Uh, so that, from my perspective, is definitely a win, uh, kind of having folks continue to grow within the space and take a variety of, of roles on that really continue to get at core problems um, our society faces. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good view. And, and Danielle, I know that, that, that Quad is just, is just starting, but let me let me rephrase it a little bit for you. How do you think how does success look like for 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 a future fellow in, in this? Because I mean, you you guys are bringing in people from different countries, so I I think that 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 was a little bit tricky. Can you tell us a little bit more that, about that? Sure. So I will say our success story is being able to launch this uh, this program. So it's a little more of an internal success story so far since we don't have our cohort of fellows yet. Uh, but uh, as mentioned, when we were uh, kind of selected to administer the fellowship, we were more or less given, you know, some bullet points of what they wanted and uh, thankfully um, some wonderful corporate sponsors. Um, but beyond that, it was kind of, uh, we had to kind of go for it while well blessed a little bit and figuring everything out. And so uh, being able to kind of get the application out there and then also work in community with our government partners, with nonprofits in every country. Um, so I, I actually just came back from a, a whirlwind tour of Japan, Australia, and India, um, connecting with university and government partners to really support the fellowship. Um, so I would say the success story is how um, exciting and collaborative, excited and collaborative, uh, with a collaborative spirit, people are interested in this program. Universities of all four countries are really committed to um, being sources of talent um, for this opportunity. And so I think uh, in terms of what success can look like for fellows. I think there's so much capacity to do really great things in this fellowship because the energy around it is really um, strong, um, both for folks uh, who will you know, pursue their graduate studies in the United States, but then also for, for coming back. So a lot of the universities talked about what if you know someone did their master's um, in the U.S. and then came back for their Ph.D. in Australia, or they did a research internship or a visiting um, opportunity in Japan? Um, what if they, you know, the, following their their um, their graduate studies, they pursue uh, a full time opportunity um, at a, a, a major public interest corporate in in India? Um, so I think there's just a lot of momentum around the fellowship, which makes it a really exciting place to be. It's it's not a hard sell, which is exciting, um, and I think that for fellows that are motivated motivated and, and want to take advantage of this opportunity, um, it, the sky's the limit. I think the, the people that are watching us here and they're going to watch us later on YouTube, I think that uh, th this is one of the key founders. You will get to to, to write that success story with, with, with the team, and I'm more than excited to see what comes next. Um, I'll have one last question from my end, and I have a couple of questions that, that have come on through the chat. Uh, so um, I am going to ask this uh, directly to Joni and uh, Rachel, Danielle, you, you can jump in. Uh, we are, I'm hearing a lot of creating this community, creating this network. Uh, but in, in part, Johnny, uh, your your fellows go into, in, into, into different places afterwards and Rachel uh, also coding and forward fellows are all over the, the federal, all over the, all over the federal government right now. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about how they interest in, in intersected with their, with their places of work, specifically uh, Johnny within uh, uh, Schmidt and, and and the places that they worked at, and Rachel, how did they intersect with the with the with the government offices that were placed? Uh, Johnny, sure, happy to. Um, so, kind of at the core of APM work is very much the idea of co-creation. So, um, with the APM program, APMs can have internal Schmidt 
master's projects, but actually the majority of their time over the course of two years is with external social impact organizations. And I think in part because of this model that makes the idea of co-creation even more important. And um, what I mean by co-creation is not just, you know, an APM or a tech person operating in a silo to deliver a technology solution for a social impact organization. It's truly working hand in hand with the communities that are impacted by this technology, with the host organizations themselves, so that uh, in partnership with these folks, we could collectively deliver technology that furthers a social good. Um, I think that's something that we are particularly mindful of, especially since um, our program is rotational in nature. We really wanna build the capacity of social impact organizations so that when our APMs rotate to another project, um, their, their previous host organizations can continue the momentum around their technology solutions. Um, so that's the first thing. And then I think more tactically, I think something really interesting and cool about the APM program is that you have this intimate APM cohort at Schmidt Futures of 10 to, to 12 folks, um, but also uh, to the extent folks feel comfortable. I know COVID is, you know, has, has shaken things up a little bit. Um, we very much value kind of our APMs going on the ground and meeting their teams um, in, in the states and kind of in the regions that they're in. Um, so, so pre COVID and we're coming back to the state a little bit more uh, now, uh, APMs tended to travel one to two times a month on site, uh, working side by side with their teams, also doing kind of discovery sprints and user research sprints um, in the, the communities that they work with. Um, so I think that's one really interesting element as well. Um, the home base of the APM program is, is in New York at the Schmidt Futures office, uh, but we very much value coupling that with on the ground experience and working side by side uh, with the partner organizations they do projects with. Rachel, same question. How 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 do your fellows are interacting with, in this case, uh, uh, now state governments, but also federal ones? Sure, yeah. So across all of our government partners, state, local, federal, um, every single fellow is assigned a manager. So we make sure that starting on day one, the fellow has someone who is there to support them across their journey. Uh, during the 10 weeks. We uh, personally, as students prior to this program, had internship experiences where you walked in the door, someone handed you a laptop and gave you maybe uh, three sentences of directions and said, go at it, which is not the experience we wanted our fellows to have. We really believe that it's important for folks um, to have internship and fellowship experiences where they're actively mentored, where they're able to grow personally and professionally, and where there's meaningful work created. We don't think it's fair to the students. We don't think it's fair to our government partners um, to not have those clear intentions in mind when starting the program. Uh, because there's only such a short period of time, we really encourage our managers to work with our fellows actively throughout the 10 weeks. So um, starting on day one, there's tons of meetings and introductions and opportunities to really get to know your team, plug in with stakeholders and understand how they might be using the product you're building or how they might be uh, interacting with a particular tool or a policymaker who might understand uh, how government is delivered to folks. Um, then uh, throughout the following weeks, we really make sure that managers are actively working alongside fellows. Our program is remote right now, so that often looks like a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of Slack messages and checking in, but really making sure folks sort of get that face-to-face -face time. Um, beyond that, we also have midpoint check-ins, so formal opportunities for feedback, um, which we think are really important professional skills for the fellows to learn throughout their 10 weeks with us, because feedback is something uh, you'll take with you for your entire professional career and understanding how to not only give feedback, but also receive it, we think is a super important skill. And then at the end of the summer as well, we have a demo day opportunity where all of our fellows um, have a chance to present their work, um, not only to their managers, but also to stakeholders throughout the office to make sure that folks really understand the impact of what was created. Um, similar to the other fellowships on the call, we also do have external communities, which I didn't mention. Um, so we have uh, an entire cohort community this summer. It's 160 fellows where folks can also interact professionally outside of the office, troubleshoot problems together, work on issues. And this summer, I'm super excited because we're partnering with another nonprofit organization, Second Day, which is dedicated to uh, strengthening the talent pipeline in the social impact space. 
and they're helping us develop an all new custom professional development curriculum for our fellows so that they can learn more about professional skills and networking, uh, navigating complex work environments as well so that they can be better equipped to work with their managers in the workplace. Thank you. Um, Danielle, let me let me just ask you a little bit. Uh, it's it's basically the same question, but I know that uh, that Quad has a whole programmatic event, right? Uh, they go to do something before, uh, something to ring, uh, just to focus the experience on, on on your fellows. Can you talk us a little bit about that? Uh, to make sure I understand the question, how we plan to focus the what what is the programmatic experience like for the fellows? Yes. Sure, yeah, so um, as mentioned, uh, I think the real benefit of the, the program beyond the financial benefit is going to be the programmatic elements because it's a way for our fellows to um, receive mentoring, uh, to really engage in their field of study beyond the academics, but really create a space for them to think about the kind of social impact of their work. I think there's, as we've been kind of doing our tours and talking to prospective students, there's been a lot of excitement to, to Rachel's point and to Joni's point about, you know, I have this technical skill, this acumen and interest, but I really want to apply it towards, towards doing something good, but it doesn't feel like there are that many pathways for that. And so our program is really built around the idea that not only are there pathways, but we're trying to really enforce the fact, fact that you should be doing this work. It is great to really apply um, your skills towards, um, you know, bettering quality of life for others. Uh, so I think our program is really focused on how do we create uh, opportunities for folks to develop um, skills such as communication. So scientific communication, how do you communicate your research findings um, to the public in an in a, um, accessible way? Um, how do you develop the leadership skills for you to be able to um, you know, advance in your work, um, you know, bringing in policy makers about, you know, how do we kind of create more conversations and fluid discussions between researchers and policymakers to really um, make sure that our kind of science and tech related policies are really informed. Um, so there's so many things outside of the kind of the academic preparation that our students are getting in their graduate studies themselves um, that we hope to supplement to, to really prepare them for what's next in their career. Um, and then really kind of tapping into the network that we create uh, uh, across the country. So, you know, all four governments um, are, are demo democracies and we really believe in the power of bringing uh, folks from these four democracies together to think about how do we, um, you know, approach challenges that uh, are certainly global challenges, but then also regional challenges. We're hoping that our fellows are excited about returning to their countries and, and, and making an impact there. So how can we pr provide opportunities for that too? So um, all of that is kind of the, 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 the ideas that inform our programming in terms of the structure, both virtual and in-person programming um, will be a part of the, the process. Most of it will be virtual because of um, kind of the nature of, of folks uh, from all over the world kind of studying in different universities. Um, but we do believe in like kind of the power of in, in-person touch points as well. So that'll be uh, incorporated in the process. Well, we did le learn that from COVID. So I think, uh, I think two years have taught us a lot about that. So thank you for asking my questions, but now it's turn to answer the, uh, the seven, eight, ten questions that that, that, that that the audience has given us. And I'm going to start, um, most of them are, are anonymous, so I'm just going to start with one that says, uh, for the APM program and Coding and Forward Fellowships, but I'll, I'll ask for, for part two, what kind of experience do you value more in applicants? Do you value more research or industry internships or any other, or any other kind of? Uh, Joni, would you mind to start? Sure, it's, it's a great question. Um, my perspective and speaking from an ABM program perspective is that um, I think whether it's industry experience or research experience, they're, they're both great. So long as you can show kind of your value, your expertise, um, some kind of experience that marries the technical with being able to collaborate, to communicate with partners is awesome. Um, so I don't think we have a preference one over the other. I think it is great to this question to be able to dive super deep into the weeds of, of kind of technical projects. Um, but at the same time, it is equally important to take a step back, um, have that kind of 30,000 foot view and um, kind of have the skills to understand how, how all the pieces fit together. Um, so hopefully that provides more context. There isn't um, you know, a, a set like, here is a person we look for with 
XYZ requirements and in big tech and in government, I think very much we look at candidates in a holistic way, also to ensure that we have a diverse, you know, a diversity of perspectives in our cohort. Um, so there could be folks that come from research, there could other be other folks that have done, you know, internships in big tech and in industry. Um, so hopefully that answers the question, but, but happy to, to dive into anything else that would be helpful. Yeah, and just to add on, I mean, Joni pretty much gave the answer that I was going to give, but uh, from putting it forward's perspective, we do look at candidates on a few different kind of qualities. Obviously, your technical know-how is one, but we don't care where that comes from. It could be working on a really complex classroom project. It could be working on a research project. It could be previous internship experiences, as long as you're able to demonstrate your skills and show that you know your stuff. Um, we're looking for all sorts of experiences and I've had that represented in our cohorts thus far. We're also looking for folks that kind of have the emotional intelligence, if you will, to work in these really challenging environments. Um, it can be hard to work in government and public service and public interest technology more broadly. Uh, there are not always easy answers to the problems you're trying to solve. And sometimes it's not clear on what the next step is to take or how you might solve a particular problem. So we're looking for folks who are kind of comfortable navigating ambiguous environments, figuring out how to work with folks from different backgrounds. You're not always going to be working with a technologist in this space. Your manager might not even be technical themselves. So we're looking for folks who uh, kind of have that emotional intelligence to navigate a wider range of scenarios that might be thrown at them. And then we're also looking for folks who are really passionate about public service, who show a demonstrated interest in working in this field. So for us, it's not just about how, how good are you at coding? Uh, that's not the only skill we're looking for. We're also looking for people who care about what happens once their code is implemented. How is a government service delivered? How does this thing function? Who's affected by what you're building? And um, you know what are the negative consequences that could happen if you build it incorrectly? So we're looking for folks who care about looking at these issues from a variety of lenses and who are great technologists, but also um, folks who are really dedicated to, to making a difference and to uh, thinking about others as well. I can actually uh, answer that question because it comes up a lot even for, for quad, whether you need previous research experience to be a competitive applicant for the program. Uh, it certainly helps, but it's not required. We understand that this is you know, a program for folks who are aspiring to master's and PhD programs, so they might not have had a ton of uh, research experience already. Um, however, if, if you've done a senior thesis in your undergraduate studies or have already done, you know, had some experience, I think that's fantastic. Um, I'll kind of lift up that selection uh, uh, criterion that I mentioned before related to orientation towards results. We're excited about folks that want to get things done. So uh, whether you've done that in an academic and research capacity, that's fantastic, but we also really value strong extracurricular experience. So if um, whether you led a student organization or had professional experience that demonstrates a track record of uh, having positive results and, and being able to make an impact and you want to apply that towards your graduate studies, I think that's what is going to excite us and will we'll really pop in the application process. Thank you. Thank you for, for all for those uh, for those answers. I have a couple more questions and I will ask our, our uh, uh, the three of you if we keep it short because I because there are a lot and I want to get to most of them. So the first one, this is just for APM. Does APM program accept applicants on non-immigrant visas who have to meet certain requirements to work in the US? Uh, short answer is yes, we definitely have international sponsorship and we very much welcome uh, international folks to join our program and have had APMs to date uh, that have done so. And I know Rachel, coding you for Rachel, is in the new process, it's still, it, it, they, they, they can, right? Uh, sure, so I'll answer this. It's a bit of a complex answer. Our federal program, which is the Civic Digital Fellowship, only accepts US citizens because you have to pass a background check and security clearance process. However, our state and local program, which is the Civic Innovation Corps, does accept international students. We have had several thus far. We do not uh, offer sponsorship, unfortunately, but if you are someone who is on an F1 or J1 visa and is able to get CPT or OPT through your university, you are more than welcome to apply and we're happy to help you uh, through the paperwork process as well. 
Thank you, Rachel. Um, the next question that I have here is, and there's a lot of, of, of interest, how do I connect with past fellows, both from the AP and including the forward? Um, and is there any way to connect with them uh, in the future? I'm happy to kick that off. Um, we don't have like a precise place where you can go and contact our fellows. Um, we try and respect the fact that all of a lot of them have full time jobs and commitments uh, now and outside of our programs and are busy students themselves. Um, instead, what I really encourage you to do is visit our blog. We've had a ton of blogs published from first person perspectives with our alumni fellows. Um, I think it's a really great place to get to know the program a little bit better. We also host a range of information sessions throughout the fall. So again, I would encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll be publishing all of our information sessions there, which include uh, several of our alumni fellows. Um, and it's a great opportunity to get to meet them face to face and ask them questions as well. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's just not possible right now, given the amount of demand that we have uh, to connect folks one on one. Uh, since we do want to be respectful of our uh, fellows' time and, and other commitments. And I could answer briefly on, on the APM program side, um, very similar to what Rachel just said. We don't have a formal structure in place to connect um, prospective applicants with APM alumni, but we do have some upcoming uh, info sessions uh, where they will be co-led um, by current APMs. Um, so that is an opportunity to learn more about their experiences uh, if folks are interested in applying to the program. Thank you. And um, I'm, I'm having a, uh, some questions that say that say they want to connect with with our speakers, with Danielle, Rachel, and Joni after the webinar. So um, after the webinar, we will send them an email with contact information with all the links that we have, uh, so that we can connect. But uh, I am more than sure that 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 all of those three websites, APM, Quad, and CIF, also have a lot of information for how to get in contact with 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 the team. Um, so this one, this one is, is, is really, really interesting. So uh, we have an incoming college freshman and he's interested in all of the three programs. And he's asking, what should he be doing to craft my best application possible for, for the, for, for your programs? Um, uh, Joni. Well, I'll just say my first reaction to that is, is that is amazing as someone who's in their first year of, of university kind of starting to think about applying to these, these programs. Um, that that's, that's really awesome in terms of the APM program. So just in terms of, um, some top line qualifications. We look for folks um, that, that are recent graduates, so a little bit farther along uh, in their in their career and university trajectories. That being said, in order to kind of uh, set yourself up uh, for the APM program and this type of fellowship experience, um, I, I would say the same thing to as a kind of the type of experience we try and give our APMs, like very much find opportunities to explore what public interest technology looks like uh, over the next couple of years for you. Um, so as Rachel alluded to, there are many different ways you can do that. Uh, that could be in an extracurricular activity, that could be taking a public interest oriented course. Um, so really kind of experimenting and exploring uh, what this space looks like and applying your skills in a variety of different um, environments is what I'd recommend. Um, I think also subtle, subtle plug for the APM program, we're trying to do a better job at um, kind of publishing content regarding the APM program, uh, providing kind of more updates on the Schmidt Future side in terms of our work and fellowship opportunities. Um, so as you continue to explore kind of this space and think about what's next, um, that could also be another way to learn more about how our fellowship programs are evolving and kind of the opportunities that are coming up on our side. I think uh, everything Joni just said is right. I'll also just say, um, as someone who's freshman year of college was not not that long ago, uh, I would say to just pursue your passions, um, especially as an incoming freshman in college. It's a wonderful time to have some academic freedom that high school doesn't necessarily offer. So I'd really encourage you to explore new courses. Like Joni said, if there's a pit course at your school or even a CS class, I think that's a great place to start to make sure that it really aligns with your academic passions and interests. Um, and I'd also say explore a range of organizations on campus. I had no idea what I was doing my first year of college. And I think you'll find that uh, most of your peers don't either, despite how much it feels like everyone has it together. Um, I'd really encourage you to get out there, join different organizations, take different classes and different subjects and see if this 
does align with your interests. And if it does from an academic perspective and an extracurricular perspective, that's awesome. But also know um, that there really is no one pathway into public interest technology that's right or wrong. Um, and I encourage you to look into a breadth of, of opportunities, um, especially going into your first year. My uh, piece of advice is very tactical, go to office hours. Um, so I think when we were an adult and you realize like, wait, when I was in college, I could have just gone into a leader in the field that I'm interested in and asked them questions. And they like, were sitting there wanting me to ask questions. I have access to them um, at a set time. I, I think you don't have that in the same way <laughs> in your adult life. Um, so it's a really great opportunity, not to, not just to, to um, get to know your professors on a kind of, oh, they, they might let it, write a lot of recommendation kind of level. It's really just how the best, the best way to learn about what you're interested in is to talk about, talk to people um, in the field about their experiences, about the recommendations that might, they might have about, you know, next steps, what you should pursue. Um, so getting to know your professors and then also getting to know other professors outside of the classes that you might take, but within the field that you're interested in um, will help you uh, figure out what you want to do next. And then also will help you develop the relationships that'll be important for your, your academic and professional career. So definitely take advantage of office hours. It can feel intimidating, but um, they have them for a reason. And I think um, it's a great opportunity. Perfect. Well, I'll ask one more question. This is this is directed at Joni and Danielle. Um, and uh, one last question for me. So this one is, is there any program in Schmidt Futures that supports new nonprofit ventures in the space of public interest technology? My, it's a little bit broad, but just want to see if, if, if there's something else that, that yeah, I think that's a, a great question. And Joni, feel free to jump in as well. Um, we have a lot of different uh, innovation funds, um, meaning that uh, different programs with Instrument Futures will have uh, opportunities to sponsor ventures uh, based on kind of the mission alignment. Um, and so, for example, um, related to social impact ventures, we have an entrepreneurship and residence program that runs competi impact competitions. So for ventures that are looking for funding um, to kind of uh, scale their work, um, they run every so often. So I, I don't know when the next one is, so you would need to su subscribe to their newsletter. But all that to say, if you search our website for the types of programs that we have, um, there's very likely um, an opportunity for a fund or a competition that might come up within that program. So um, signing up for the newsletters of the programs um, is kind of the best way to stay in touch about those things. Perfect. Well, uh, I have, these questions keep coming in. Uh, I, I will ask this one because I think it's, it, it's a short one. I am currently enrolled in an online master's program that is accredited. Does that uh, count as eligibility for the Civic Digital Health, for the Civic Digital Fellowship? Um, it's hard to say without knowing exactly what you're referencing, but if it is a program that is accredited by the U.S. Department of Education, um, yes, that is completely fine. We don't care if your classes are in person or online. Perfect. Well, uh, we still have, a, I just have a couple minutes left with you. So I'm just going to ask this one question to the three of you. Would you mind repeating key dates so that there's the last thing that, that we say in this public uh, sector and that people really understand that? And um, uh, where can they find you? Rachel. Sure. I'm happy to start. Yeah. Um, well, you can find us online at codingitforward.com pretty simple and easy. Um, all of our links are on our website, whether you're interested in finding more information on our programs or following us on social media. I'd also recommend uh, subscribing to our newsletter, which is at codingitforward.com slash subscribe. I'll also drop that in the chat. Um, our newsletter goes out on a biweekly basis. We plug a ton of amazing early career opportunities in the public interest technology space, as well as resources and news. Um, and in terms of important dates for our programs, as I mentioned, um, our programs won't open applications again until early winter. So um, we don't have an exact date in mind just yet, but definitely keep your eyes peeled and subscribe to our newsletter um, so that you'll be the first to know when that does happen. Tony. Awesome. Uh, just drop this in the comments, but um, I included our APM program website, which shares more about the APM program. Um, and in terms of a key date, the deadline for our upcoming fall 2023 cohort is August 1st. Uh, so currently accepting applications. Um, so be sure to get that in over the next two months. And lastly, Danielle. 
Yes, last but not least, but the earliest deadline, June 30th. So for the Quad Fellowship, the application is the end of this month. If you're interested, hop on our website today, poke around, get started um, so that you can uh, submit it by June 30th. Thanks so much. Well, with that, I thank you all for being here. I thank your audience for, for joining us today. And I hope that at least we have new applicants from, from, from all across the, the U.S. and all across the world and quite uh, that, that get to join. Uh, thank you so much. 